Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we are gonna cover mucus, why you should care about it, what the relevance is, what it does, what is it made of, and this is going to be a primer for my big mucus series. You guys have heard me talk about this a lot in previous videos about how the health of the mucus lining is really, really important and how you have to have that mucus to protect you from your microbes and what can go out the door when you don't have proper mucus lining. Well, this is the beginning of a big series. It's probably gonna be about four videos long. Let's get ready to talk about mucus. So first of all, let's talk about what we are talking about and what we're not talking about. I'm not gonna be talking about the mucus in your nose or your sinuses or your post-nasal drip, although it is all one in the same conversation, but rather for the purposes of my channel, we're gonna be talking about the kind of mucus that's relevant to you if you have irritable bowel syndrome or IBD or SIBO or GERD, the mucus that hangs out in the digestive tube. So once you get down into the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine and the colon, this is where we're really gonna focus our efforts. And mucus is exactly what you think of it as far as like a booger or a snot. It is the same exact stuff and it protects you or the cells of your intestinal epithelium, your intestinal wall and your immune system from the microbes that are swimming around in your intestines on a day-to-day -day basis. So in the middle of the tube, if you were to imagine, if we cut your intestinal tube down the middle, like we were cutting a garden hose and then looked in the middle, you've got all these nice folds, all these nice villi that give you extra surface area. And this picture here is as though we took a little snapshot about yay big and blew it up to a much bigger size. So now we're seeing the individual cells of your intestinal lining. We're seeing some of the immune system that hangs out right beneath waiting for stuff to get weird. And then you can see that nice mucus layer. In the stomach and the colon, the mucus layer has two parts to it. And we're gonna to get to that momentarily. There is a thicker part that is very tightly adhered to the epithelium itself. And it should be practically impenetrable to bacteria. And then there's a looser layer of mucus where some of your microbes can live, like acromantia, which we'll talk about in another re related video. But there are two layers here, and there's one layer in the small intestine. And that's gonna become more relevant as we get into the conversation with IBS and SIBO, why that one layer of mucus is important and how it differs from that of the colon. But for right now, all you need to know is that that slime layer is protecting your gut lining and your immune system from the stuff that's in the middle of the digestive tube, namely your food particles and your bacteria. But here's some more food for thought and why we're focusing so much on the mucus lining and why I'm talking about the mucus in and of itself is that it has other purposes as well. So yes, it forms a physical barrier between you and the outside world, that is the bacteria and the food that are in your intestinal lumen. But also there are other things that this mucus does. For one, we already alluded to the fact that some bacteria like Acromantia and some Bacteroidetes species like to live in that loosely packed mucus layer, that outer layer of mucus, well, the mucus actually provides food for them, which is a good thing because they then help produce more mucus, which is kind of cool, at least Acromantia does. But also they help protect that lining, they help beef up this mucus layer and protect you from the other microbes, and they are so close to your immune system that there's a direct link of communication between bacteria like acromantia and your immune system. And it's very profoundly anti-inflammatory, anti-autoimmunity, you name it, acromantia seems to do all of it. And we're gonna talk about that in a future video. So the mucus lining itself not only provides protection from a lot of microbes, but it feeds other bacteria. It provides a fuel source for bacteria like acromantia so that they can be happy and healthy and strong and they can make you happy and healthy and strong. There's other research that suggests that the mucus layer directly affects the bacteria in and around it, and it affects their virulence. That is to say, it affects how nasty or not nasty your bacteria are. So the genes that turn on, say, toxin production, or the genes that turn on its ability to attach to the epithelial cells directly, those virulence genes are modified and that expression is modified by the mucus layer, which is so freaking cool. So if you do get a bad bacteria, if you get food poisoning or some GI bug, the virulence of that is going to be modified if you have a nice intestinal mucus layer to protect you, not only as a physical barrier and a space between you and that bad bacteria, but if that bad bacteria does get in, it'll actually start to modify those virulence factors for you to make it less pathogenic. 
Additionally, there's also research that mucus is protective against gastric cancer and colon, colorectal cancer, at least in the early stages. Now, once you already have cancer, it actually goes the other way. You can have too much mucus and then that could be pro-carcinogenic. But as far as the standpoint as preventing cancer, mucus is an anti-cancer tool for your immune system. And I think it's because it's so anti-inflammatory and it modulates the gut microbiota in such a way that it's profoundly anti-inflammatory and protective against cancer. And then finally, in the stomach, we could think about mucus layer, especially that thick mucus layer that's closer to the epithelium, but the mucus layer is protecting you from the secretions and from the chemicals that you might not want direct contact with. So if you, if you imagine that this is a stomach, well, there would be a lot less bacteria, but you could imagine that the pH of the intestinal contents or of the stomach contents are gonna be so acidic and so abrasive that you need that buffer. You need that space between to protect you from that acid. And that's exactly what mucus does. And that's what I've talked about in other videos is that if you don't have this nice mucus layer, you're going to become much more aware of your, your, sto sorry, your stomach acid level. And that's where people get gastritis and ulcers and many more problems from the exact same pH, the exact same amount of stomach acid as a normal person. I think for a lot of people, it's more that this acid barrier is now penetrating the mucus and it's getting at the epithelial cells of the stomach and it's causing a lot more irritation. So mucus not only provides space between you and your microbes or space between you and your food so that allergenic proteins like gluten or dairy or peanuts don't have easy access to the immune system in and of itself. It's also a buffer and a space between you and your microbes. You're also modifying how nasty or how virulent those microbes are. You're affecting whether or not those microbes are going to make you more prone to things like cancer development. And you are protecting yourself from your gastric juices and your gastric acid so that you're not charring your own stomach lining with stomach, not with stomach acid that is. Now this will become more relevant as we do a subsequent video about things that increase the health of the mucus lining, but I wanted to give you a little primer on what mucus actually is and what it's made out of. Now about 90% of mucus as we see it is actually water. So we're gonna just ignore that, just know that mucus is a lot of water. And when we get down to the nuts and bolts of the stuff that your body had to produce to make mucus happen, there's a couple of things to know. So I gave you this really rough little schematic and you can imagine that each of these is a single unit. So here's one, here's two, to make it kind of stand out better. There are many small units that are then linked together, and we'll get to that in a minute, and they are bound together to make this big tangled chain, and then many of these put together create that mucus layer, that slime layer. So here we have one molecule of mucin, one molecule of the mucus lining, basically. Well, if we were to zoom in on one of these, that's basically an oligosaccharide. And you'll recognize that term from all of my FODMAP videos, or if you know what that acronym means, a FODMAP is a fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyol. That's what FODMAP stands for. Well, these are all oligosaccharides. So they are lots and lots of carbohydrates with a bit of protein. So we could zoom in and say, all right, there's one oligosaccharide. You could zoom in a little bit more and get more detail. And I'll use two colors for this. But basically each one of these monomers is made up of a protein. And then each of those proteins has, <laughs> that was harder than it should have been, has many branching oligosaccharides or carbohydrate chains coming off of it. And the relevance for this, particularly in the stomach, is that the sections of these proteins that are covered by these branching carbohydrates have protection. So in the stomach, for example, you have a lot of proteases or enzymes that degrade protein. So if this mucin was just a protein backbone and nothing else, it would be digested by your own protein digesting juices. I'm gonna to try to speed this up and make it a little uglier, sorry guys. Um, it would be digested by your own protein degrading enzymes. So that would be kind of silly. So rather, when these, when these uh, protein backbones have some carbohydrate fluffing them up 
and giving them that protection, now your own proteases, your own digestive enzymes are not able to get down to that peptide and break it down into little molecules so that you digest and absorb it. So you've got this protein backbone for each of these and you've got a lot of branching oligosaccharides. So there's a lot of carbohydrate content. And out of all of this, you can imagine that about 80% of the actual chemical of mucin itself is carbohydrate, specifically oligosaccharide type, type carbohydrate. Now, you have these loose ends at either end of each of these, and you can see here and here, there's gonna be a little tiny bit of that protein that's exposed. And you can see here and here, there's gonna be some protein that is exposed along this chain. That is held together by disulfide bonds. And that's something that we're gonna talk about in more depth also, and why disulfide bonds are very, very important and what you can do nutritionally to support that. So don't worry, the next video is gonna be all about how you can support mucus production. But just know that this is predominantly carbohydrate, oligosaccharides. This is one of the reasons why I'm so big on the whole FODMAP thing and why eliminating FODMAPs from your diet is not a long-term strategy. You're going to really tank your ability to make mucin and keep your mucus lining healthy and healthy and therefore interact with your microbes in a healthy and secure way and keep those microbes from becoming virulent and nasty. All of that goes out the window if you don't have the carbohydrate to form around this protein backbone. And likewise, dietary protein is very important too. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian and you're not being super mindful of your protein, or if you have low stomach acid and you're not able to digest your protein, that becomes relevant as well. But really the takeaway here is that this is about 80% by weight carbohydrate, uh, again, ignoring the water because you didn't have to make the water, but this is all carbohydrate fluffing around and protecting these proteins and then that is giving it the structure, and then that is the bulk of what mucus actually is. And it's worth noting at this stage of the game too that there's another factor that we have to discuss. We can talk about what mucin is made out of, we can talk about what it does and where it is, but who makes the stuff? That's really important to acknowledge too, because if we know the type of cell that produces this, we can talk about what we can do to keep those cells happy and healthy. And that's gonna be your goblet cells. Now, I drew this and then realized it looks like a foot. So now you have to live with that, just like I do. But goblet cells are these columnar cells that are very long, and they have just tons of vesicles. It's like if you were getting ready to have a snowball fight and you had all of these preformed snowballs ready to go, right at the, at the go, at the ready. Well, goblet cells have all of these little preformed vesicles full of mucin ready to be released out into the epithelial layer and out into the mucus lining. And they're constantly producing more mucin, packaging it into vesicles, and then releasing those vesicles to produce more of a mucus lining. So they're very, very important cells. Now, the way that these cells get their stimulation is a couple of fold, but there's two main, main signals that I wanna talk about that regulate this cell and what tells it to do its job. The body is not dumb, you guys. It's so, so smart. And what you see here, and I'll kind of continue this so it's covered and protected too. The mucus creating cells, the goblet cells are well aware, I think, that their job is to protect you from your microbes. So if there are more microbes or there's a diverse array of microbes that are being sensed either by these immune system cells and then they can relay the signal over here to their buddies or directly from the goblet cells, if the goblet cells are getting more stimulation from more microbes and a more diverse array of microbes being the key, they're gonna get the memo, they're gonna get the 411 and say, oh man, we had better make mucus to protect you from all of these critters. Well, this brings in the conversation about diversity. If you tank your diversity on a restricted diet, not necessarily just low FODMAP, AIP, keto, a lot of diets will do this, but if you tank your microbial diversity because you don't have dietary plant diversity, then that is going to alter the signals that these goblet cells are getting. And if they don't get the signal that you have a wide variety of microbes that you need to be aware of and protect against, they're probably gonna get lazy and they're not gonna do their job as efficiently as they could. So A, those goblet cells are sensing the world around them and they're sensing microbes and their microbial compounds, things like LPS and indole. And they're sensing that world and they're realizing whether or not they need to create more mucus for you and protect you. The other thing to know is that these compounds, like let's say short chain fatty acids, like butyrate, 
short chain fatty acids specifically, as well as some other microbial compounds, directly stimulate and directly fuel the goblet cells as well as the intestinal epithelial lining. And they give direct stimulation that is anti-inflammatory and amazing to the immune system that hangs out underneath the epithelial lining. So short chain fatty acids like butyrate are very, very important for modulating the effect of these goblet cells and telling them what to do. And you could even go as far as to say that goblet cells are fueled by short chain fatty acids, as well as the intestinal epithelium. They are so important. And guys, if you tank your diversity and if you don't have enough fiber and carbohydrate in your diet, you are not gonna make short chain fatty acids. You're not gonna make butyrate. And then same thing, you're not gonna tell your goblet cells to do their dang job and you're not gonna have a mucus lining worth the crap. So making sure that you have enough diversity in your diet to foster microbial diversity up here and also the production of the short chain fatty acids, the carbohydrate and the, the prebiotic and the fiber content of your diet to actually produce short chain fatty acids it is just monumentally important. And this is why I created FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days. This is why I've been such an outspoken critic of diets like the low FODMAP diet, because it is not a healing diet. It's a big old band-aid. And in the long run, you're gonna compromise things like your goblet cells and your diversity and your microbiome health. And that's just gonna give you a world of hurt. The other thing to realize, and I'll draw this in a different color, is that, now you could make the argument of who's really in charge. But another thing to consider is that the nervous system, the brain, the vagus nerve, the enteric nervous system, all of the nerves are gonna give direct stimulation to your gut and to the goblet cells to tell them to do their job. I saw a really nice quote in an article that I meant to share. I could put in the doobly-doo below. I don't have it memorized. But there's some reason to believe that the autonomic nervous system, so things like the vagus nerve and the fight or flight response, has an incredible impact on these cells in particular, as well as the whole gut-brain axis, your motility, your, ju your juices secretion. All of your gut function is regulated by your autonomic nervous system. And that goes back to things like the adrenals and the stress axis and making sure that you're not frying your adrenals to a damn crisp with stress. And that was actually, that was a whole topic in FODMAP Freedom already. We already covered that in a great deal of depth. But just know that your nervous system is really running the show just as much as your microbes are. They could be tied one and two, but know that your microbes and your nervous system are tremendously important for rehabbing the system and making sure that you can actually produce mucus and keep that mucus lining healthy. Now, if you are thinking, oh my gosh, this already was super overwhelming and she has like three more videos on the mucus lining, what do I do? I have good news. I have other ways that I can help you other than YouTube videos, although I have a boatload, so go have fun with that. But I actually do work with one-on-one -on -one clients, both in the state of North Carolina where I live, as well as elsewhere. We could do some telemedicine via Zoom, have a grand old time. We'll talk about mucus, we'll talk about other stuff, but we can order the vast majority of testing, at least in the United States, quite easily, whether or not you live in North Carolina. So I would love to meet you and do some telemedicine with you if you live elsewhere, or if you're in North Carolina, I would be tickled pink to meet you in person. Or if you would like, there is information down below about FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days. That is my online course. It's going to be relaunching again in a couple of months. We're in the beta group right now, and already we are making so many great changes. I am so excited to share the results at the end of this group. But if you would like more information about FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days, or if you would like to join the wait list for that launch, go ahead and link in the doobly-doo down below, and you can sign up for email alerts, and I will let you know when FODMAP Freedom is open for enrollment again. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.